This lecture will cover chapter 4 in your Campbell Biology book entitled Carbon and the Molecular Diversity of Life. So let's talk a little bit about carbon. Carbon is the backbone of life. Living organisms consist mostly of carbon-based compounds. Carbon is unparalleled in its ability to form large, complex, and varied molecules. And finally, things like proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, and other molecules that distinguish living matter are all composed of carbon compounds. And these are all the things that we talk about in large part in chapter 5. Let's take a look at carbon. Carbon is depicted here in the center by this black ball. Carbon is unique in that it has four valence electrons, so it can form up to four covalent bonds with a variety of different atoms. This ability that carbon has to form bonds with up to four different atoms um, makes large complex molecules possible. When thinking about these large complex molecules, think about those organic compounds that we talk about in Chapter 5. In Chapter 2, we talked a lot about chemistry, electrons. Remember that electrons are the ones that are responsible for forming bonds, participating in chemical reactions, and so therefore the electron configuration is key to an atom's characteristics and basically what type of bonds they can form with other atoms. And then for carbon specifically, the valences of carbon or those electrons in that outer shell and its most frequent partners, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, are the building code for the architecture of living molecules, meaning basically all those things that we talk about in Chapter 5 um, are carbon bound to hydrogen and oxygen mainly. So then if we refer to organic chemistry, organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds. So basically compounds that would then contain carbon. Organic compounds can range from simple molecules to colossal ones. So there is a whole range and variety of sizes for these organic compounds. And then finally, most organic compounds contain hydrogen atoms in addition to the carbon atoms. And it can also t contain, they can also contain other atoms as well. Let's take a look at isomers. Isomers are compounds with the same molecular formula, but different structures and properties. In that, we can divide isomers up into a couple different type of isomers. The first ones are structural isomers. 
these have different covalent arrangements of their atoms. We can also have what are called cis trans isomers, which have the same covalent bonds but differ in spatial arrangements. And finally, we can have what are called enantiomers. And these are isomers that are mirror images of each other. And in the next couple of slides, I'll show you pictures and the differences between these different types of isomers. Okay, briefly, if you look at this picture, you can see the difference between structural isomers, cis-trans isomers, and enantiomers. And in the next few slides, I'm going to show you each picture separately so that we can talk about the differences between each one. So in a structural isomer, remember I just told you that structural isomers have different covalent arrangements of their atoms. So if you see here in a structural isomer, they will have the same molecular formula but different structures. So the way they come together is different for each one. So for the picture that you're looking at here, you see pentane and 2-methylbutane. They both have 5 carbon um, atoms and 12 hydrogen atoms, but the way in which they are arranged are different, forming um, the two different isomers. So they would both be 5 carbons and 12 hydrogen. So their molecular formula would be the same as I've written above, but the way they come together uh, would be different. So this would be an example of structural isomers. Another example of structural isomers, if you want to look this up, would be glucose and fructose. Again, same molecular formula, but the way they come together is different, making them two different compounds. The next group are cis-trans isomers. I just mentioned before that cis-trans isomers have the same covalent bonds but differ in their spatial arrangements. Um, these compounds have the same molecular formula, just like the structural isomers. But in this case, they differ in their spatial arrangements due to the inflexibility of double bonds. So in cis-trans isomers, you would still have the same molecular formula, but because of the double bond that we see there between the two carbons, it makes it more difficult for those pieces to rotate. So they would not be able to rotate to look like one another. Therefore, they're stuck in those configurations. So one would be a cis isomer where we see the two X's are both on the same side. The other one would be a trans isomer where the two X's are on opposite sides. And again, because of that double bond, we cannot flip them and rotate them to look the same. And therefore, they would be isomers of one another. Enantiomers, as I mentioned before, are isomers that are mirror images of each other. So again, these are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but different structures, and in this case, the compounds are mirror images of each other. This is because they differ in their shape due to the presence of an asymmetric carbon, one that is attached to four different atoms or groups of atoms. Because of their arrangement, these enantiomers are non-superimposable, meaning that we cannot place one on top of another and give the same molecule. Because of their arrangement with the carbon, they end up as mirror images of one another, 
it cannot be placed on top of each other. Enantiomers are important in the pharmaceutical industry. Two enantiomers of a drug may have very different effects. Sometimes one enantiomer of a drug can work, another one may not. Sometimes they both can work, but one may work more efficiently. Usually only one isomer is biologically active. And then finally, differing effects of enantiomers demonstrate that organisms are sensitive to even subtle variations in molecules. So in this figure, you can see um, a couple different drugs. This is why it's so interesting in the pharmaceutical industry because a lot of the different drugs will have um, will be enantiomers and one will be effective and one will be ineffective and in here you can see um, ibuprofen the effective version and then the ineffective version both being enantiomers of each other and albuterol another drug that's used in relaxing the airways during an asthmatic attack. Again, we have an effective enantiomer and an ineffective enantiomer. So if they were treated with S. albuterol, for instance, there would be no change in the bronchial muscles. There would be no relaxation. However, with the effective one, the R. albuterol, there would be a change in the airways. Okay, so a little bit about functional groups. Functional groups are the components of organic molecules that are most commonly involved in chemical reactions. The number and arrangement of functional groups is what gives each molecule its unique property. The figure that you're looking at now shows the seven key functional groups that are most important in the chemistry of life. So we can see the hydroxyl group, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfhydryl group, phosphate group, and methyl group. And these are the seven most important uh, in the chemistry of life. I'm just going to end this lecture on chapter four, summing up on a review of the chemical elements of life. So first, the versatility of carbon is what makes it possible um, to have the great diversity of organic molecules that we have. Uh, we'll talk about four important categories in chapter five. And then the variation at the molecular level lies at the foundation of all biological diversity. So with the way that carbon can come together and interact with other atoms and the molecules and compounds that it can form really give rise to all biological diversity.